All right. Welcome to Willing to Fail. I'm your host, Peyton Bennett, and today we have a very special guest. He's the founder of a little company you may have heard of called Reebok. He's also the author of a book called Shoemaker, which is the story of how he created Reebok. And with no further ado, Joe Foster, welcome. How are you? I'm fine, Peyton. Thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, I'm happy to, uh, to talk about the book. So you were... Born and raised in Bolton in the United Kingdom to a family of shoemakers, and your grandfather was credited with the, uh, inventing the spiked running shoe. So I'm sure you learned a lot about making shoes from your grandfather and from your family. What were some like, things you learned hands-on from making the shoes, and what are your, some other things you just learned from being in that environment? Well, I guess that uh, you know, when, when you're born into a family, the family had been uh, making running shoes since... 1895, and I'm not born until 1935. So the, the family, I grew up with it. And you know, when, you, when you're a kid, you, you don't uh, recognize anything different. That's what, that's what life is. You, know, you don't feel anything special. You don't feel anything in odd. But, you know, we were part of a family. And my grandfather, Joe, he was, uh, he was a member of the local athletics club. Not a good runner, but he enjoyed it. And, you know, usually a midfield finisher. And so he thought he'd make himself a pair of shoes and it, his idea put the spikes in the bottom. And in 1895, when he was 15, he made his first pair of spike running shoes. And they, they raised him up. He, he did far better than his, uh, his teammates would really enjoy because he, he came a very un, unusual second in a race. And of course, that <laughs> had caused a lot of attention. So naturally, he wasn't a big lad, so we don't know whether... They sort of pushed him in the corner and said, look, you've got to make us some of those shoes. Or whether they said, please, Joe, make us some shoes. But that was the start of his business. Unfortunately, he died in 1933, which was 18 months before I was born. And I was born on his birthday. So that's why I am Joe. <laughs> that, that's, uh, I was also born on my grandfather's birthday. So that's pretty cool. Oh, there you are. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah, you obviously learned, I'm sure, even though you – you never met him in person. I'm sure just secondhand you learned some of his tactics of making shoes, but do you think there's anything that you got from him, like genetically, that you naturally were gifted in something that he was also gifted in? I, I think there must have been something in the genes there because uh, my father and uncle, they didn't seem to have that same enthusiasm. They were happy to work in this business, which he had, he had built, and uh, uh, they maintained it, but they didn't, they didn't take it forward. You know, when you, uh, you can't stand still in a business, you've got to move forward. If you're not moving forward, you're going down. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, but he had, and, and so probably, probably I, I didn't, somewhere in the genes and in that DNA, I picked up something which said, you know, you, look, there's something more than just standing there making a shoe. It's, you've got to sell it. You've got to create a business. And uh, so I, I think you're right. I think there probably is something there. So was there any... So it seems like a lot of entrepreneurs, they always have a bunch of different things they're working towards when they're younger. For you, I know being born into a shoemaking family, was there anything, any other second thought to pursue something else besides shoes or was it just always shoes? Um, <clears throat> well, in, in those early days, of course, I mean, I spent six years from being four years old to 10 years old during the war, World War II. <laughs> and in World War II, of course, there was not much going on. Uh, there was a blackout, so there were no lights. I mean, what we see today is lights, no street lights. The, the only thing is we had double summertime, if you understand what that means. Double summertime for us meant that, you know, we changed the hour during summer so that we get a little earlier in the morning so we get a little more light at night. At 11 o'clock at night, it was still light because it, they moved it two hours. So, and this... <laughs> So we could be outside doing whatever we're doing, running about doing silly things, but just as kids. But any ideas of me being uh, setting up a company? I don't know. I used to do some good swaps. We used, to, <laughs> you know, if I if I had a a small car, a dinky car, we used to call them, and I thought somebody else had something that I wanted. Then we, we did a few trade-ins, but not money. In those days, I don't think it was possible to get a small job. <laughs> <laughs> Gotcha. So, yeah, I mean, I can't imagine growing up during a war that just like, it's hard for me to fathom. Um, but for you, it, like you said, when you're younger, it's kind of just like the normal. And you talk about in the book how you were, these, some of these bombings that were close. And then, of course, you go on to uh, fight in the war, be part of the army for a little bit. 
or any of those experiences you think played a major role in molding you to who you are today, whether in the army or just as a kid being around that environment? Well, I didn't fight in the war. <laughs> the war was well over by the time I, you know, what we had after the war for maybe 15, 20 years after World War II, there was conscription. There was conscription in America as well. You know, you, you had to do two years of national service. So you had to go into the forces for two years. And then in, in, the, in the forces, you, you learn discipline, you learn how to look after yourself. And, uh, and, and I think that prepares you for lots of things. Probably today, it would be going to university or college. But in, in those early days, this was like going to college. I mean, I'd done a couple of years of college previously, um, but then two years of national service takes you away. You know, mother's no longer there making your meals and doing your washing or whatever it is. So uh, I, I don't think that prepares you for setting up a, a business, which eventually we did, of course. And instead of being scared of it or anything, it was an adventure. Yeah, so that was, and that kind of leads to what I thought was like the most powerful moment in your book was finally making that decision to take that leap of faith and go f start your own thing in that moment when you told your dad and he was holding that like uh, a letter opener. Can you, for people who haven't uh, read the book, can you talk about that moment and what was going through your mind and kind of the decision making process to finally do that? Well, let me take you back to doing national service. Okay. <clears throat> because I was uh, 18 when I went to national service and 20 when coming out. And Although Jeff was older than me, we did national service at the same time. We both came back. I think Jeff was about three months different from me. But we came back, and we came back to a company that was failing. So we came back in. You know, we hadn't realized that before, that uh, you needed to do things. <clears throat> but having, having grown into our, our own skins, as it were, we came back and we looked at a company, and that company was failing. Uh, it took three years trying to get uh, my father either to persuade Uncle Bill at that time, that they should be doing things. We should have a plan. We should have salesmen. Yep. We didn't have any of that. They were still living off uh, word of mouth and advertising in Athletics World, which was Athletics Weekly, which was a magazine where they get a lot of orders from. But they weren't moving forward. And uh, we tried. We tried hard. We even went to college to learn more about shoemaking. Uh, because all we knew was how to put some spikes in the bottom of a shoe and cause a running shoe. What we knew was what we learned. But we did pick up a lot of contacts, which was good going to college because people from around who were in the shoe business, we, we learned a lot about shoemaking and we had a lot of contacts, which again became very useful. But uh, finding that we could go nowhere, it was in 1958 that I, I did approach Father. He, he was in the office sitting down and I can remember it very, very well. And I said, uh, Look, Dad. You know, Jeff and I, we've discussed this for a long time. We've tried to discuss it with you, but unfortunately, we're going to have to leave the company. And of course, that, that, that confrontation, was, uh, <laughs> I do remember him standing up and holding, uh, holding a letter open. And at first I thought, what's he going to do with that? But he did turn it around and hand it to me and say, stab me now. <laughs> I said, no, well, Dad, you know, we... We, we don't want to be dead or whatever, because previous to that, you know, he, he, he sort of said that we'd sort of implored, look, come on, we've got to move. And he goes, look, when I'm dead, when I'm gone and Bill's gone, this will be your company. And all I could respond to that was, oh, dad, you know, we don't want you dead, number one. Uh, and number two, this company will be dead before you are, because it's dying on its feet. So, yeah, that was, that was rather a confrontation in there. <clears throat> it, uh, <laughs> well, I don't think we spoke for, a number of years. <laughs> Mother sort of held us together, but um, uh, as, as far as father, because he, he thought I had also led Jeff astray. He thought I was, I persuaded Jeff to come with me and do this. So <clears throat> for whatever reason, Jeff didn't seem to get the blame, <laughs> but I did. And uh, so, yes, it was, uh, it was quite a moment and it was a decision. That was it. We turned around. Um, seemed like a good that. decision in hindsight, maybe a tough one, but a good one. So, I mean, you talk about how your, your dad and your uncle were fighting and it caused a lot of turmoil in the company and you were about to go start a, the same, a similar company with your brother. Did you ever think that maybe you guys would have that issue or did you guys always get along pretty well? We all always got along very well. We didn't socialize together. Uh, there were two years between us. Jeff was two years older than I was. Uh, I think with my father and uncles, about five years between them. Now, whether that made a difference, I don't know. <clears throat> but 
we we had that at the back of our minds we know that we also were very well aware that um adi dassler and rudy dassler they fought as well um but in those days rudy had left the company and set up puma so adi dassler and adi dassler and and, and that worked for them. In fact, it worked so well for them because they, they were at each other's throats so much that they were really building businesses, just doing something better, and everybody else was getting the blows. They, they, <clears throat> they just grew tremendous businesses, so it worked for them. But for Jeff, Jeff and myself, Jeff just enjoyed being in the factory and running the factory and running the shoemaking process. That's all he wanted to do. So it was left to me to do the marketing, do, do the promotions, advertising, <clears throat> do the sales, and more or less all the rest of it. So that's why we, we didn't fight, because I'm doing one thing, and he's looking after the factory. That's good. It sounds <clears throat> like a good mix. Um, so I thought was another interesting part of the book was when you started that company is running under a name, the name Mercury, and then you run into some trademark issues, and you have to come up with a new name, um, and basically just end up pulling something out of the dictionary. Can you talk about that process? And I know you liked the word Reebok when you found it, but what was everyone else's reaction, especially having to rebrand after building another brand? Yeah, well, it's, uh, I mean, we'd only been going. We're a fledgling company, and we'd only 18 months of uh, experience with our company, and we enjoyed doing it as Mercury. We also had the Wing Messenger as our logo, and that worked, worked very well. <clears throat> it was the accountant who said, uh, look, you know, You've got to register your name. You're doing pretty well. And if somebody else comes along and starts making shoes with mercury on it, you could be in trouble if you don't register that name. Well, we went to the registrar to find out that mercury itself was, in fact, pre-registered. I think Lotus and Delta, an English company, part of British Shoe Corporation, rather large company. They did offer us it for £1,000, but £1,000 to us in those days was impossible. It was like $100,000 now, you know, just for a name, you know. Have you got it? <laughs> Is it in your back pocket? You know, how do you, how do you manage that? Uh, I mean, so no, we couldn't do it. So the advice was uh, go and see a patent agent. They will sort of search out um, the registrar. And I would see the patent agent. And he was in Manchester, our local big city. He pointed through his window. He pointed to a sign, Kodak. Oh, so why Kodak? And he said, well, it means nothing. It's not a name that you pick up from anywhere. They make, it's an invented name. If you can give me that, fine. But bring me 10 names. So bring me 10 names and we'll see which one the registrar will allow. And, oh, yeah, we sat around the table with all these names for birds, animals, you name it. We had everything. But uh, I found Reebok in the dictionary. But that dictionary, I won that dictionary in 1943 when I was eight years old. <clears throat> I won a race. And the prize was an American dictionary, Webster's. It's a weird prize. <laughs> well, well, I see. I, I mean, I, I wondered many times since, well, why, why would I get an American dictionary in the middle of World War II in 94 as a prize? I, I don't know. However, as you say, I, I like the letter R. And uh, on top of what we've been doing and thinking up names, I'm flipping through my dictionary, my Webster's, and I come across Reebok, R-W-E-B-L-K a small South African gazelle. And I think the fact that we bought easy, two syllables, sounds good, easy to pronounce, that, that's good. <clears throat> but the fact it was a gazelle. And everybody said, well, why not? So I went back to the, to the uh, patent agent and I said, look, here's 10 names. You've got them, but we want that one. <clears throat> we we got to have we bought because we, we got to be in love with this. This has got to be our passion. We don't want any name. We won that. And since it happened, it was the only one that came out that I could use. And um, the registrar allowed it. But he did say, unfortunately, you have to go into B part of the register. <laughs> I amazed again, what, what's that? What's the B part of it? Well, he said, if somebody comes to me and say, I want to make shoes out of Reebok skin, I can't stop them. Oh, all right. But uh, 20 years later, the registrar came back and said, we've moved you to the A part of the register. Because now everybody knows that Reebok is a shoe. It's a sport shoe, not an animal. <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so that's, yeah, it's kind of weird how you just randomly or luckily got that dictionary and turned and helped you create the name Reebok. Another, another cool part of your book that you talk about is these people in your life that you refer to as gatekeepers, um, which I found really interesting. Uh, can you kind of explain 
what you mean by gatekeepers and where you got that term and some of the gatekeepers you met in your life? Um, well, for me, it means a person who you can hand a key and, and, and you can entrust them with taking the brand the way you want it. So, it, I mean, the first job was finding the key. What was the key to get into the American market? I had six failures. I started off in 1968, my first trip to, uh, to the States, to the NSGA show, the National Sporting Goods Show in Chicago. It's cold in February. I've yeah. never felt so cold. <laughs> so, <clears throat> however, um, the product I, we, we had was well accepted. Um, and the, uh, the buyers were sort of saying, well, where do we get your, uh, your, your shoes from? And I said, England. England? Yeah. New England? No, 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 no. England, across the water. Oh, that, that put an immediate stop across the water. Yeah. They, were, they were not prepared to buy it from, to import, really, and that was a difficulty. Not. And they said, well, when you get somebody over here, when you've got some stock over here, well, let us know and we'll buy. It took me 11 years. <laughs> wow. 11 times going backwards and forwards <clears throat> that I realized that um, the, be the best way is to have people buy it off you. To buy it, they need something. They need a, I, I think in America we call it the hook. They need something. And for me, it was the key. For them, it was a hook. And it happened that, uh, and this is where a lot comes in. So we were a running shoe company. We'd, we'd missed out on the football boot company, the football boots, because Adidas had taken that. By the time Jeff and myself got ourselves going as Mercury and then Reebok, Adidas, uh, were, they were really owned the football or soccer market. I think you got it. <clears throat> they owned that. So we were a running company. And in the 70s, running took off in America. Really went wild. And uh, that was driven by Runner's World. Runner's World was a magazine, and it became the Bible. And all during the 70s, running just, just grew. I, on the back of running, of course, we got Nike. Nike grew with it. New Balance grew with it. And I think Brooks and Tonic, all these companies are coming out of that. And uh, Bob Anderson had decided that uh, they had so much influence. They decided that they would do some tests and rate the shoes, number one, two, three, four. Of course, they did that. And, of course, number one shoe in America. How many runners? Hundreds of thousands. And everybody wanted a number one shoe, wouldn't you just? Yes, you want the number one shoe. Could they supply? Could Nike supply? When they, no. They were bringing them in from abroad to gear up to the demand. Six months later, by the time you got these shoes on the shelf, and then in another few months, Bob Anderson was rating the shoes again. So another number one, a different number one would come up. That caused problems. Two or three years of that, and the, the retail trade had had enough. No, 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 no. They persuaded Bob Anderson, and he, he saw the sense of it. Instead of saying number one, two, three, four, we'll give them star ratings. So the top shoes, and there could be three or four, we'll give five stars. Anything we give five stars, we'll say four shoes. Then the demand is spread. Oh, retailers, much happier right now. But that, that gave me an opportunity. I, I went to see Bob Anderson, and I got to know him, and I got to know how he, uh, how he judges these shoes, what they were doing. So. Uh, I made a shoe specifically to get five stars because I thought that's what we need. We need that five-star shoe, and it was called Aztec. We tested it out at the Commonwealth Games in Edmonton uh, in Canada in 78. 79, I had it at the NSGA in February. Along came came out. Yep, we, we'd like to sell your shoes. And uh, a little later, but said, we'll, we'll have 25,000 pairs. <laughs> well for our factory back in, in, uh, in the UK. That was about six months' work. So we knew if we got five stars, we needed two things uh, because they also said, you're, you're, too, you're too expensive, we need a better price. That meant going to the Far East, meant going to Korea. And it also meant we had to get increased production. First increased production we could get. I had a friend at Barter. Barter could make as many shoes as you wanted. Unfortunately, we had problems with them, but... <clears throat> We needed five star, and by August, um, Paul Feynman also, he said, look, I'd, I'd like to be your, uh, your distributor, I'd like to do it for Reebok, but we need five stars. And I said, look, Paul, we'll have to wait till the issue comes out, but I'm pretty sure we're gonna get five stars on hopefully. 
when the issue did come out, and then, you know, I, I phoned Paul Feynman in the morning and said, Paul, go, go down to the kiosk and, and, and get a runner's world. Um, an hour later, he came back, because it must have been seven o'clock in the morning when I, I phoned him. And he came back He said, Joe, we've got a five-star shoe, as take, it's got it. Brilliant. That was, that was, uh, that was right, let's take the rest of the day off now. That, that was a winner. That was the key. And, uh, but he said, also your other two shoes, because the uh, Aztec was a road training shoe, which was a big demand one. We also had a, a racing shoe and we had a track spike. And all three got five stars, which is brilliant. <clears throat> so we had the key. Now, the gatekeeper, I preferred Paul to uh, Kmart. Kmart would be, only be interested in the space that they had, that they would put the shoe in. And if it didn't sell enough, that would be the end of it, one, one shot. Uh, with Paul, I needed a steward. I, I, we all also had the empathy with Paul. He, he was a small distributor. Boston Camping it was in those days. Um, and so we said to Paul, well, fine. I, I said, look, we've got the five stars. And that was the beginning. That was a... He was, he was the gatekeeper. He opened the door. He needed somebody. He needed an American who knew the market in America. Not me. It needed him to, to build that. And to me, that was the market. Uh, we had, uh, I've been going over the States, say, for 11 years, going to the NSGA show. And there were numerous British companies because the Board of Trade, the British government, supported that. Uh, and they would, they would pay for the stand. And they pay for our fare as well and help us right. to get there. Uh, but we were the only one. We were the only one that got distribution. The rest, even bigger companies, were, never got there because they didn't find a hook. They didn't find something. The need. So people started to need to buy Reebok. Once we had a five-star shoe, how do we get this? So he was a gatekeeper. And the second big gatekeeper, of course, was Arno Martinez. Arno Martinez, he was a tech rep for us down in uh, California. And uh, his wife, Frankie, she was going to these aerobic classes with her girlfriends and coming back, full of it. Oh, brilliant. This, uh, <laughs> you know, what goes on there? You know, what are you doing? Oh, well, we're, we're sort of exercising to music. And I said, I'm going to come and have a look at this. So he went down there and he saw the class. He saw the instructor in running shoes, half the class in running shoes, the rest just bare feet. And he thought, maybe this is an opportunity. Maybe, maybe we can do something here. Why don't we make a shoe? And he went back to Paul Feynman and said, Paul, uh, look, there's this robe, it's, it's new, it's, uh, but it's really good. And what we need to make a shoe. And Paul Feynman said, forget it. <laughs> now, look, we're doing really well. We're running. We're expanding nicely. You know, we're busy. What more do we want? Why would we want to make some shoes for some girls dancing around down in L.A.? <laughs> then... <laughs> Didn't, didn't put on off. Arnold went round to the back door and into the production people and said, look, guys, make me 200 pairs of these. Uh, I, I need to see what we can do. They made him 200 pairs. And they made them out of glove leather. Glove leather, you don't make shoes out of well, You do, but uh, not the way they were making this. Uh, but he, they made 200 shoes, out, and he gave them out to the people down there in L.A., mostly instructors. And that, that was the beginning of something that slow burn to begin with, but the explosion. And the difference was, this was Reebok. Who's Reebok? They didn't know. They weren't runners. They were girls. Some runners, quite a few runners knew us. But, I mean, they didn't. We weren't known like Adidas. We weren't known like Nike. Male. Sweaty. No. They were very nice, beautiful English. Nice flag on the side. And beautiful white shoe. And we became a woman's running shoe. And that was the difference. Adidas, Nike, and others just stood back and said, no, it's just a craze. It just won't happen. But it drove the company from $9 million to $30 million to $90 million, $300 million, and $900 million in successive years. Wow. So, yeah, and you, and you talk about in your book how you had to get lucky in these parts, and it sounds like maybe that wasn't one of them. Would you think that that... Um, your gatekeeper helping you get into that market of the women's aerobics? Do you think that was like your luckiest break? And what do you think, if not that, what else would be your luckiest break? And also, what do you think was the unluckiest thing that happened to Reebok in its journey? 
The luckiest break was the fact that um, running had taken off in, in America and became a big category. It was big in sports shops. In fact, they were opening special sports shops, athletes, athletes for people like that, just for shoes. So mm. that was the biggest luck that we had. We were there at the right time. Uh, the, rest, the rest was something you needed to work for. We worked mm. to get a five-star shoe, and we got it. So we were very fortunate. But the luck was being there at the right time. It was the same with aerobics. I will recognize that at the right time. Uh, but the luck is the fact that it happens to be there. What is, do you feel like there, you got any like, unlucky breaks that like, set you back in the journey? Many. <laughs> <laughs> Many. None that stand out, though. But whether you call them unlucky or whether you just call them problems, and You're it's how you answer your <laughs> it's how you answer your problems, um, I, and I, I think that problems are, are one of the best experiences you can have because it basically confront how did you get in that position, why did you get in that position, was it your your fault or was it just bad luck? Um, yeah. Mostly it's bad luck, but the problem you've got to get over. You can't just leave it as bad luck. And most of our problems we we manage to turn around because I, I always believe that if you've got a problem, you look at where's, where's, where's the benefit. Yeah. And, you know, we, um, we had to change our name. Was Reebok better than Mercury? I would think so in the end. I would think that was a better name. Um, we had to change our silhouette. At first we started off with two stripes and a T-bar on the side of the shoe and added a sense of the letter. I think we've only been four years in business. And Adidas has complained, well, they said they'd take us to court because our side stripes were infringing the three stripes. Um, wasn't that we were, we were not willing to fight. We were delighted. It was like, oh, Adidas, Adidas are writing to us. They, we got them worried. All of a sudden, Adidas recognized we're here. So it was more of a, wow, that's brilliant. Okay. A bit awkward again. We had to think and change that, and that that turned out to be eventually the vector. Uh, and the vector was a silhouette again that uh, became easily recognisable. And that's lucky, you know. How, how this comes about, these things, one thing yeah. builds on another. So, uh, yes, you, know, you you do so many things. And uh, what's your luckiest break? The running market. Okay. That was the luckiest. And then you might say the aerobics market may have been even luckier, may have been, but we needed to get into America because that was the number one market in the world. It influences every other market. Yeah, especially at that time too. Um, but yeah, I like how you put that where the things that could have been unlucky, like running into the trademark issues, running into like that actually turned into you probably getting a better name and even a better logo. So that's, you think that's more of, you just, your natural optimism and your natural problem solving, or is that something you learned, do you think? No, I think you either are an optimist or you're not. If you're optimistic, <laughs> yeah, some people are going to look at you and say, you're an idiot, you shouldn't be doing that. You know, you, right? I suppose an optimist is also a risk taker. And, and I think if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you've got to be a risk taker. You take some risks. And uh, risks can also get you in trouble. You know, the... You, they can lead you down the wrong path. But then again, if you're an optimist, you can always you know, you make a decision and there's nothing wrong in changing that decision. It's the people who try to make whatever they've decided to do work. And if it's going against whatever, don't, don't try and make it work. There's another way around. And, you know, <laughs> you, you don't try and beat your way through something. You can try and go, if you can go around it, you go around it. And, and I think, yes, I, I think I was born optimist. I still am. You know, it's still that uh, the glass is uh, half full, not half empty. Yeah, I think I think I'm the same way with you, as you on that one. Um, so looking back, you've lived a long life of ups and downs, building Reebok, and it seems like an incredible journey that turned out really well for you. Looking back, is there anything that you would change, or any regrets, or just keep it all the same? You know, when when you've achieved a result that is probably beyond your wildest dreams, certainly in those <laughs> early days. You know, it's difficult to sort of say, hmm, I regret anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, uh, in 1980, my brother died, and we just, 1980 was the year that we just started making it in the USA. So we didn't see any of this. And, you know, uh, and, then, and that was in 1980. In 1988, my daughter died of leukemia. And she had seen a lot of it, but... You know, 
if you could, wouldn't you change those two things? If you could. Yeah. But unfortunately, you know, the, the realism is you can't change those things. You, you're not in charge of what happens in, in those directions. But uh, no, I, you know, I, I got to say regrets are really a waste of time. There are many things you might say, why, why did it do it this way, do it that way? But, you know, it's, it's the same thing. And when I, when I left Reebok at the end of 1989, we were the number one global sports shoe company. We'd overtaken Nike. We'd overtaken Adidas. You know, it was a great time. The thing is that uh, a company can, can remove anybody, but they can't find a new founder. They can't change that. The founder will always be the founder. So whilst I'm still around, I'm still a founder. Um, okay. and yeah, you know, I, I still like to think that we can make something with Reebok. Maybe the book. Maybe the book will waken up a lot of people in the 40s, 50s, and 60s who, who, who wore Reebok. So if you, uh, if you were still calling the shots or you were still pushing the envelope forward, would you, is there any ideas you have in your head or anything that you would want to do with Reebok or just let it keep going the way it's going? <laughs> well, um, as you know, that Adidas now control Reebok and Adidas bought Reebok to get Adidas more momentum in the USA. And that worked. That worked very well for them. It didn't work well for Reebok because uh, I think they sort of put Reebok on one side and it's just slowly it's gone down. It's not, I mean, it's, it's hardly in any stores. You don't see it. The, the only one thing that I would like to see Adidas do is to give it more, uh, more visibility. <clears throat> but then again, the people at Adidas know exactly how to make Reebok number one. They know that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't. I can't teach them anything. They, they, they're well aware of everything that could be done. But I mean, you know, it's up to them to have policies, how you, how you have one company, have two. And, you know, if you run it as Adidas Group, yeah, the only thing that they, they, well, they won't do, I don't think, and that is to separate, become something, have a holding company. And, and then you run Adidas and Reebok separately. But they know, they know that. I'm, I'm not, uh, <laughs> I can't teach them anything as far as I'm concerned. They've been very successful in, uh, in building the Adidas brand. You know, when people take over a brand, they think, no, we must make it different. And they change the, the name, style, they change the logos, they change things. And what they do is they're taking away something they bought. <laughs> they t- they're throwing it in, what, into the bin. What they bought, the value is there in what people recognize. So what they've done the last, well, it's probably less than two years ago now, they've brought it back. They've come back to the Mototectura lettering where the R drops down, come back to that lettering, and, and they're now using the, uh, the Vector logo on everything. Instead of they were using the Delta, they've got all sorts of things. They've got something, yeah. And that's something you don't do with a brand. You, know, you think of Ford. What do you see when you think of Ford? Just that that four over there, <laughs> and have they played with that? No, <laughs> that's been the probably nearly a hundred years now. And in that letter, you do not play around with your image, and that is probably one of the reasons that Reebok hasn't continued to grow because people want to play, want to change, think they can improve it. Um, but it didn't get to the place it was unless that image was good, recognizable, and what people think of the brand. I just know that when they bought it, Reebok did need a management change. It needed that change. It needed because it got stuck. It wasn't really moving forward. And so it needed a change. And unfortunately, it worked for Adidas. But now I wonder if Adidas could think, well, yeah, let's see what we can do now with Reebok and we're going to make it grow. They know what to do. Yeah. I think they're trying some odd things. But uh, so uh, what would I say? Well, as I've just said it, you know, they know. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Well, I appreciate your time. The, uh, the last question I have for you before I let you go is just as somebody who's been through a long entrepreneur journey, for people listening to this that may be thinking about pursuing an idea or in the middle of pursuing a business idea, what it, other than not playing with the logo and building the – <laughs> Not trying to rebrand too much. What advice would you give to any young entrepreneurs out there? Well, a young entrepreneur has to uh, originate a logo, of course. He's got to get an image. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and I think that's probably the most important thing to do in your life. Um, There's so, so much out there. This, this medium, the, the internet. In, in the 1950s, 1960s, we didn't have computers. We didn't have the internet. 
We didn't have mobile phones, technology. Whatever you do, you must know technology. Go with technology. Technology is the way that, that drives everything. And you, know, you must know it. You must know your business. I can't teach anybody what to do. I just know that if, it, if I was young now, technology would be where I'd be looking because I, I used to get out on an airplane. I used to travel around the globe and do so many things. Um, now, I, I, I would arrive in, say, uh, Hong Kong or whatever, and I'd have to go to the hotel room and try and make a call. The, the receptionist would say, I'll try for you, sir. And it could come back within an hour. <laughs> Sometimes it was a day late, <laughs> whatever it is. So the communication was, I had to travel. Now, you're sitting there in California. I'm here in, uh, in the middle of the UK. We are three, 4,000 miles apart. I don't know what it is. We're also, we're eight hours apart. And, and yet we can do this. And yeah. COVID has helped, if you will, if, if the good things from COVID. COVID is driving this technology, information technology, this. And I, so much technology, technology now in photog photography, the whole thing. You can, you can now watch a, a match of whatever it is, whether it's American football, and you can see every detail. You're almost on the pitch now. So wh whatever you're doing, wherever you're going, follow the technology or even create it. I agree with that. I mean, I never, never thought I'd be just a couple of years ago. I never thought I'd be sitting talking to the founder of Reebok over, <laughs> over a zoom call. That's pretty crazy, but yeah, I appreciate you giving me the time and for anyone listening, definitely go check out the book shoemaker. It was, I loved it. I listened to it on audiobook, and it was very easy to get through as I always love hearing the stories from beginning to end. So I thought it was a great book. Well written, very well detailed. And did you do a lot of that writing or did somebody help you with that? I need a lot of help. I have the story. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, need, you need something to say, well, this is, because you tend to underplay things. You mm -hmm. tend to say, well, I did this, I did this, I did this. I, we landed in uh, Tehran and, you know, a few things happened and off we flew. Uh, no, you, you need to get the emotion. Try to bring the emotion. So, yeah, I, I had a lot of people help. And they were yeah. willing to help and I was willing to listen and learn. And, yeah. Uh, but, you know, a story, that's one thing. You know, there's nothing wrong with the story. It's how you tell it. And so, yes, I got a lot. I, there's only one thing left now for me as far as I'm concerned, and that's getting this book to number one. <laughs> All right. Yeah. A number one bestseller. Uh, but that's good. It's another bit of ambition. Always going forward. Yeah. That's a, I like ending on that one. That's a good way to put it. Uh, well, I appreciate your time. Joe, and it was great talking to you and hope everyone listening here is, feels a little inspired or goes out and listens or reads that book. Thank you, Peyton. It was, it was great. Lovely talking to you. Thank you so yeah. much. All right. You have a good one. Thank you. And Indeed. that's the show. Thanks for watching. We got a lot more interviews coming with some legendary guests that you're not going to want to miss. So go ahead and click that subscribe button. That way you see as soon as we release them. Also, check out our website, wtf-sports.com. We got merch for every NFL team. Some are hilarious, some are just cool designs, and some that have nothing to do with the NFL. So check it out. Thanks for supporting us. See ya.